Well, I'm very pleased uh, today for, for us to be able to talk to uh, Lisa Pullman. Lisa is the Executive Director of the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Um, the, the Natural Resources Council of Maine is one of the reasons, one of the organizations that makes Maine a great place to live. Uh, they've been guarding the, uh, the environment in the state for many, many years. I've been familiar with, uh, with past executive directors of the, of the council, and, and I've just recently uh, met Lisa. So I, I'm, I'm glad that she's able to join us, and I'm pleased that she's given us the time. And I'm going to ask Lisa at this point, before I get too much involved in this, because I'm really not the expert in this, if you would just uh, address um, the, the, what the Natural Resources Council of Maine is, its history, maybe its mission, and, uh, and its current emphasis. Lisa? Well, thank you, and hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to, to be here, and let me just start with the Natural Resources Council of Maine was founded in 1959, so we have been at it for we're going into our 54th year, and it was begun by really just a group of Maine people who got very concerned about the possible uh, creation of a dam that would have really ruined a very wild and beautiful part of the state of Maine uh, called the Allagash R River. And they banded together and stood up for the river, and basically the dam was not built, and it eventually was uh, designated as a scenic waterway uh, at the national level. So that was the NRCM's first victory, and it has been very involved at the head of pretty much every major environmental issue in the state ever since. We have a mission, a basic mission, to protect, restore, and conserve Maine's environment now and for future generations. And we do that really in, in several key ways. We work with Maine policymakers. Our office is a block away from the State House in Augusta, so we're very focused on the laws and the regulations that are involved in protecting the environment. But in order to do that, we also have to engage Maine people and to call their legislators and uh, be a part of the process. We have uh, 16,000 members and supporters both in the state of Maine and across the country, people who live away, maybe they grew up here, or they still have property here, and uh, makes for a very powerful uh, citizen voice. So that's how we do what we do, and we work in the area of protecting the North Woods, protecting Maine's watersheds, uh, working on clean energy and energy efficiency, and trying to get toxic chemicals out of the environment, which is part of what we're going to talk about today. Well, Lisa, that was quite an interesting take on the council. I knew some of that, but uh, you brought me up to speed on some of the other things that's going on, and, and the history is very interesting. And I'm kind of curious, um, how did you get into this business? How, how long have you been the executive director, and, and what, what prompted you to take on this this kind of work? Well, I have been working uh, in advocacy-based organizations in the state of Maine for my whole 33-year career. I moved to Maine in 1979 from the Midwest and uh, began first working on the issue of domestic violence for 10 years, where I led uh, an organization there. I then worked um, in a, a, a advocacy organization in Augusta that worked on uh, low-income issues, health care, and social welfare. And during that time, I got on the board of the Natural Resources Council of Maine because uh, at the time I was also working on sustainable development, which means trying to balance policies uh, around the issues of the economy, the environment, and communities. And decided I loved NRCM, I also loved my other work, but I uh, was ready for a change and became the deputy director in 2008, and four years later I became the executive director, so I've been in my role for a little over two years now, and I would just say that I really love advocacy because it's so much about standing up for what you believe in. I really believe in the democratic process. I think it's very important for people to take that seriously, to pay attention to what I call the rules of the game for how we're going to play this, uh, be on this planet together. And those, to me, are partly the, the laws that we, that we enact as a people. And uh, I think it's very important for people to get involved in that and, and be informed and, and have a voice. And that's really what advocacy is all about, and I love my job. And now I'm 
working on the issue that I came to Maine uh, in the first place for, which is Maine's beautiful environment. I am a huge outdoor recreationist. I kayak, I cross-country ski, I camp. I just last weekend took my grandson out on a hike up a mountain, and this is really uh, a place that I thoroughly love and very much want to protect. Well, thank you, Lisa. That that personal input is is uh, is great. I mean, I I share your your love of the state, and I'm doing some of the same things with my own grandchildren, so I can recognize what you what you're talking about here. Um, I, I know the council is particularly concerned with toxic elements in the environment, and and the class has uh, has had a module on toxics in the in the environment. Um, I know you're working on mercury. Uh, could you just get into a little bit of detail as to how the Research Council does the advocacy on something like mercury pollution? Well, we got involved in, in the issue of mercury over a decade ago. There was actually a, a national network that sort of pulled us into it. For those of your students who might not be that familiar, mercury is a, is a toxic heavy metal that that has been shown to cause brain damage and heart problems in people. It's really a very dangerous chemical if ingested. And so, um, and, and it, it sticks around. It, it persists and accumulates in, in the environment and in wildlife and can really, over time, cause developmental and neurological defects. We have mercury in our fish and in our loons and eagles. As a matter of fact, it's some of the highest in North America here in Maine. And uh, in our state, the Bureau of Health actually warns pregnant women, women of childbearing age, and young children to limit their fish consumption because of how much mercury we have in Maine's environment. So you might ask, well, why is that the case? Well, Maine is sort of the, the, the tail pipe for the end of a lot of uh, the jet stream bringing uh, pollutants from coal-fired power plants in the Midwest in particularly, and those emissions carry mercury, and they end up in our waste stream, in our lakes, and eventually uh, in our waste incinerators and landfills. That's just the stuff coming from the Midwest, and of course then we have a lot of products that have mercury in them. So going forward, we'll, we continue to try to work on sources of mercury. We do that through our energy project, working on, you know, carbon emissions and that sort of thing, uh, but also by specifically addressing um, products that are sold and people use that have mercury in them and, and what to do with them at the end of their life. Well, thank you. That's very interesting, Lisa, and I wanted to add something to this. Uh, some of you students may notice on the wall of your house a circular a dial looking type of device and it's the uh, it's really now it's an old fashioned th um, th thermostat and it has a mercury capsule inside of it and I understand Lisa you can correct me if I'm wrong that in the state of Maine uh, you can actually get that recycled and there's a uh, there's a bounty on it is, uh, is that true? Yes that's right so um, we have a 
That's absolutely true. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, thermostats is kind of the are kind of the cornerstone uh, program for us. To let me back up a minute, we have a whole part of our our taxix project that we call product stewardship or extended producer responsibility. Those are just fancy terms for what are we going to do with the stuff at the end of its life. And um, the basic concept is that all products and their packaging that we buy eventually reach the end of their useful life and become quote-unquote trash. And buying manufactured goods at the store and then throwing them away for local towns to deal with by landfilling them or incinerating them or recycling some of it is really a pretty dysfunctional system. And, um, you know, I'm sure people, your students across the country know of big mounds or big holes where we're throwing all this junk in. The concept behind uh, product stewardship is that the manufacturers of these products and the packaging ought to share the responsibility for managing them when they become a waste product. And as the designers of the product, these manufacturers really have the most ability and therefore the most responsibility to minimize the environmental and public health impacts of these products. So this product stewardship notion is a policy tool because it allows us, the people, to require manufacturers to basically internalize the cost of production and consumption that basically used to just be sort of absorbed by the environment and by human health. So if a company that makes a product that contains toxic ingredients like mercury should not just be able to shirk their responsibility when the thing is done and, you know, and somebody else is trying to figure out what to do with it. So in Maine, we have created seven product stewardship laws so far for the most toxic and problematic items we find in the waste stream. And that's where we get to mercury thermostats was one of the first ones that we went after. It's a significant portion of the mercury going through the trash system. And in Maine, manufacturers of these products are required to fund and operate a collection and recycling system to capture as many of these thermostats as possible. So we have a $5 incentive payment when you go to turn yours in. Um, you get paid for doing that, and as a result, we are one of the top two states for collecting thermostats uh, per capita in the whole country, and we just recently actually uh, had a report about that that we released. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm glad we got a chance to discuss the product stewardship, Lisa, because I find that a fascinating bit of public policy and a real uh, good way of solving some of these environmental problems at the source. And one of the things we talked about in class is how to create good public policy and how difficult it really is because of all the stakeholders that are involved. Um, and we discuss stakeholders in the scientific basis. Um, what other elements make for good, successful public policy like the stewardship policy you just talked about? Well, I'm glad that your students are talking about this. I had quite a lot of uh, coursework in public policy myself, and what I remember is that, this, you know, a logical form of, of doing public policy would be, well, you identify the problem, you research the alternative solutions, you decide which one you're going to do, and then you do it, and then you evaluate the results. But that's really not how public policy is made. It's much, much messier than that. There's conflicts over what the problem is. There's never enough research to really create certainty about what the right outcome should be. Um, you've got stakeholders, like you say, who are working hard to maintain their particular economic interest or maintain the status quo against your idea of the change. And, of course, everybody's trying to frame the issue from a communications point to make their side seem like the most logical thing to do. So, and ultimately, I think it's really challenging what is good public policy is really in the eye of the beholder. I mean, I work with people who are diametrically opposed to what I think is the right thing to do, but I don't think they're trying to make bad public policy. We just see things very, very differently. So, on the issue of uh, product stewardship, for example, um, you know, one of the most iconic uh, programs that people are very familiar with is the Bottle Bill. That's a product stewardship bill where you pay five cents to, to buy the thing, and then you get five cents when you bring the bottle back. But the bottling companies 
don't like the bottom bill, and they're constantly in the legislature trying to fight against it. They don't want the responsibility. They don't want the cost. And um, I can't tell you how many times we've had to be back in after 30 years of having one of the most successful bottom bills in the country uh, uh, to fight about it again, and we just had to do it recently. So um, there's always a pushback, and things that you think are settled are not really settled. And We've uh, continued to try to move products forward uh, for product stewardship, but uh, there's always another side. Thank you, Lisa. I think that that was a very good discussion. You know, I've heard the um, equating making public policy to about the same as making sausage. You don't want to watch how it's done because you may not want to take the product and it when it comes out the other end. But um, it's interesting to, to hear you talk about it. And one of the things I'm going to want the students to take from this interview is to take a look at public policy and think about how the public policy process works and what their experience has been with it so that we can have a discussion about, it, about how good public policy can proceed. Well, Lisa, I really f appreciate your taking the time to discuss this with us. I think it's going to be a very valuable part of the students look at environmental health. And um, once again, thank you for participating with us in this interview.